God is good. All the time? All the time? Amen. That's right. God is good all the time. And it is a, a blessing to see uh, what Pastor Paul just did. And we did the same thing. This is my Bible. I am what he says I am. I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. Today I'm taught the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I will never be the same again. And it's such a blessing to recite such a, a creed. Because like he said earlier, this is an absolute truth. There is no uh, error in this Bible that we could question or even wonder if it is true. It is absolute truth, the word of God. And it is inspired by God's breath and we should take it as it is. And so I am glad that, that you are able to do this and your congregation is really blessed by having this type of creed recited. And so it is such a, a blessing when I was looking at the Bible creed and say, wow, this is good. Uh, this is a truly uh, the church that God has uh, a desire to grow and use to impact globally. And so I am really blessed to be here. And thank you, Pastor Paul, for allowing me to come and speak because it's always joy of mine to speak at a different congregation because regardless where we are, uh, what ethnic background we are from, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ if we are truly children of God. And so it is joy of mine to, to worship with different congregation. And, and I've been to uh, different states in the United States. And it is such a joy again and blessing. Uh, this morning or this afternoon, I just want to share something that God has placed in my heart that I try to share with a lot of people. And that is, what kind of people does God use? I know God wants to use people and his children and his servants and his followers, but what kind of people does God really use? And I was sitting here at 10 o'clock service and Pastor Chung spoke of the man who was filled with the Holy Spirit and also in faith. And similar to that message is what I want to share. Maybe it's God's provision and God's plan of sharing and really bombarding us with the message that is uh, there's a uniformity. And that is that we want to be used by God. And I've been to a lot of conferences and a lot of conventions, uh, serving as a pastor's uh, national coordinator. And what I have noticed is that whenever you go to conferences, uh, it is not just one president or officers who does the, all the work, but volunteers. Without volunteers, it is not possible. So even coming into church this morning, a lot of people volunteer, whether it was a parking attendance or, or someone helping at the front. A lot of people volunteer and, and help out with the ministry, and that's exactly the way it should be. It used to be where a pastor or dynamic speaker would draw people, great preacher, and people would flock to listen to him. But these days, if you think about it, with the Internet and, and you know, all the uh, assessed um, the things that we have through the internet and through other ways means we are able to listen to great sermons. So it's not the dynamic preacher that draws people, though it does help. What draws people, what makes church grow, is when everybody, every member of a church engage in ministry, actively participate. It's not a, a something that you come to observe or as a spectator, but you are to engage in ministry. And that's what, I want to, that's what I want to focus on this afternoon. Because Apostle Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Paul says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So Paul says that we are appointed for certain things for the, the ultimate goal of edifying the body of Christ and to grow healthy, vibrant church. So every member of the body has to work, pitch in, engage in ministry. Now if you really think about it, if it was a one-man show, who would have been better than Jesus? He was the greatest preacher. He was a master teacher. He was a, a miracle worker. And yet Jesus chose to take 12 of the disciples and train them for three years and then send them off and have them do the work. Because God wants us to know he wants to use the people like you and me. But there are certain characteristics that, that God wants to, to find in the people whom he uses. And what are those? There are four that I want to share with you based on today's passage. So if you have your Bible, would you turn to the book of Acts? 
chapter 4, verse 13 through 22. Though it's not mentioned here, if you look at chapter 2, you will find a Holy Spirit come upon the people, and everybody were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and so it is the base of being used by God, that we need to be filled with the Spirit. But there are certain characteristics we find in here of Peter and John, and that's what I want to focus on this morning, so uh, this afternoon. Keep on saying morning because I'm so used to preaching in the morning, and so uh, preaching in the afternoon is something that I wasn't uh, so accustomed to. Anyway, uh, so if you turn to uh, Book of Acts chapter 4, verse 13 through 22, let me give you the context first. After Christ ascended, the disciples gathered together in Mark's upper room. They prayed. As they prayed, the Holy Spirit came up on them. So they were filled with the Spirit. They started speaking in tongue as well as, as being bold about sharing the gospel. And things changed from that point on. Peter and John, on their way to temple to pray like they are traditional or a ritual thing. On their way, they saw this man who had been crippled for over 40 years, the Bible says. So he was crippled, begging. And on that particular day, Peter and John stopped. And that's another sermon. We need to sometimes stop and see what God is allowing us to do. But Peter and John normally would pass him by because he was sitting there begging for 40 years and nobody seems to pay attention then. But on that particular day, they stopped. And then they looked at him and said, you know, the gold and silver I do not have, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And, and they healed him in the name of Jesus. So when he was healed from this 40 years of crippled infirmity, everybody were so excited and they were so shocked. How can this be? And when people gathered, Peter took that opportunity. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, make the most of every opportunity. So Peter took that opportunity and he started preaching to the crowd. And people were believing. And the Bible says, so many people came to know Christ because of that incident. So when that happened, the officials or the Sanhedrin, the religious rulers, they did not like what was taking in place. They did not want people to preach in the name of Jesus because they thought it was all over. When they crucified him, I thought that was it. But they, are start, they continue to preach in the name of Jesus. And so they captured Peter and John, kept them overnight because it was late. The next morning, they decided to have a little trial. So that's what we find, okay? So take a look at verse 13. I'm reading from NIV. It says this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with this man? They asked. Every, everybody living in Jerusalem knows that, that they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them. In the better translation, it says uh, a threat. But then warn them uh, to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they call them in again and command them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in the God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who has miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So he's been sick for 40 years and he's been healed. Well, there are four things that I said earlier that I want to share with you, the characteristics we find in Peter and John. The first thing that we need to learn is be courageous even though you are ordinary. So another way of saying it is ordinary but courageous. Can you say that? Ordinary but courageous. Yeah. You may be an ordinary person. You may be an average person, but you could be courageous in Jesus Christ. And we find in Peter and John. Peter and John were fishermen by their trade. They were not professional evangelists 
if you were to say that. Yeah. They were fishermen by trade. They were, they were not trained adequately. They were no one special. I heard many of you are very well educated in this uh, congregation. Uh, a lot of PhDs, great, great. It makes it all the more easy for me to preach this message. Because verse 13, if you look at verse 13, it says they were unschooled and ordinary men. They were not highly educated people. And yet, they were courageous. They were bold about sharing God's plan. The ordinary men, their average status did not stop them from being bold about sharing the gospel. You see, the first 13 mentions that not only that they were ordinary people, that somehow these religious rulers were able to see these men were very bold and courageous, like I was saying. Often we think, you know, I don't have a lot, so I cannot help out. I have not learned a lot. I'm not well trained, so I cannot teach or help out in ministry. I don't own a lot of money, so I cannot give. Or I don't have a talent, so I cannot help in the ministry. We often think, I don't have this, and I don't have that, and I don't have enough of this, so I cannot engage in ministry. That's the typical thought of what people think. When they, are, when they are challenged to engage in ministry. Isn't it what people say? Well, I, I don't have talent. How, how can I come up here and I'm not really good with the words. I'm not really outgoing personality. And focus on myself. And you know, that's exactly what we find in the book of Exodus too. When Moses was asked to lead the people of his uh, gods out of bondage, bondage of Egypt, you know what Moses said to God? You remember the story of the burning bush? And God says, I want you to lead the people, my children, out of bondage of Egypt. And, and Moses says, but Lord, who am I to go? And if you really know the story, that's exactly correct. Because Moses was a, not an ordinary man. He was an extraordinary person. In fact, he was 40 years trained in palace and the wilderness. But he was a fugitive. He killed a man and he was you know, running away. So he was questioning, who am I to go, Lord? Who am I to go? And do you know what God said to Moses? Don't worry. I will be with you. And then the Moses says, well, God, but, but what if they don't believe me? And so God says, well, let me give you some signs. And you know the story, and you have seen the Ten Commandments and all, right? And then Moses didn't stop there. Moses says, but, but I don't know what to say. And then God says, I will give you words to speak. And then Moses didn't give up. And, God, and then Moses says, But Lord, I'm not eloquent. I'm not a good speaker. And God says, I will teach you. Not only that, I have your brother Aaron ready for you. And what God was trying to tell us from that story is that, Moses, you got it all wrong. You think it's about me? And so you keep on saying, I, I don't have it. Who am I to go? I don't have this. I'm not well in speaking and all that. And God says, no, 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 Moses, you got it all wrong. It's not about you. It's about me. And God is saying, I will be with you. I will send you. I will prepare a person for you. I'll give you the words. It's about me, not about you. When God wants us to serve in ministry, don't think about what you don't have. Don't say that you are an average person. It's not about you. It's about God. We are worshiping Almighty God. Let me give you a word that we could learn and, and hopefully remember for a long time. It is the word responsibility. Word responsibility is a compound word. Word responsible plus ability. What I want you to take away from this is we are responsible to God's ability, not our ability. When God calls us for responsible person, he wants us to respond to his ability, not our ability. When we focus on our ability, what can I do? How can I do things? I don't have enough. Then we can question that it is not possible. Absolutely not. And in John chapter 6, you know about this feeding of 5,000. When Jesus says, go bring what you have and well, we don't have money. This is late. They keep on giving excuses. And God says, no, 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 no. Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you have. And offer that. And God blessed it and fed 5,000 men alone. David Dawson 
taught us about these important things. We are responding to God's ability. Whether you are ordinary or not, whether you are an average person or not, whether you have been trained well or not, if not, why don't you learn? Why don't you be trained? And ask God, Lord, how can I use what I have, what you have given me for your kingdom ministry? You know that one person makes a whole lot of difference? Abraham, he was a son of idol uh, maker, and he became the father of the nations. Esther was a, a Hebrew young lady who was not supposed to be the queen of Persia, but he, she became the queen of Persia and saved a great annihilation kind of plot. What about David, a young shepherd boy who's not fit to be king, and yet he became king, the greatest king perhaps, most beloved king. What about Billy Graham that you all know? It was a, a dairy farm boy from North Carolina, and he became great evangelist that we all know. It is possible. It could be an average person. You and I could be an average Joe. But we can do extraordinary things if we are courageous in Jesus Christ. And that's what we find in Peter and John. They were ordinary people, but they were trained. In three years, when they were filled with the Spirit, they were no longer an average people, but courageous people. Here's the second thing that we want to learn about them, is that they experienced Jesus personally. They experienced Jesus personally. See, at the end of verse 13, if you look at it again, it says they realized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. And this does not mean that they were just following Jesus. They knew that Peter and John were very close to Jesus. They had personal relationship with Jesus is what they're saying. In the Bible, you find Jesus had a multitude always surrounding Jesus. And there were many people who followed Jesus for days. There were many people who heard this great sermon, such as Sermon on the Mount, all of it discourse in Matthew 24. There were many people who witnessed the miracle of raising the cripple from opening their eyes of the blind, even raising the Lazarus, the dead person. They witnessed all these miracles. And there were many people who even experienced eating those five loaves and two fish. There were many who followed Jesus, but only few were actually touched by Jesus. Only few were having intimate relationship, personal encounter with Jesus Christ. In following three years, I believe Peter understood who Jesus Christ truly is. And therefore, Matthew 16, 16, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is a confession that came out of personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, do you have that personal encounter with Jesus Christ? Not head knowledge. You could read about Jesus and you could know about this, but do you know Jesus personally? Does he know you as a son and daughter of his? In Acts 3.6, like I said, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, when they had this personal encounter with Jesus Christ, Peter said, I don't have gold and silver. Before, I couldn't help you out because I, didn't have, I don't have gold and silver. But now, even though I don't have gold and silver, I can help you. Why? Because I have something that is in me that is far more precious, and that is Jesus Christ. That personal relationship. Unfortunately, many people come and sit here in the pews listening to sermon not understanding or not having that personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's the saddest thing. You are exposed to the gospel, hear a message every week, week in, week out, and yet we don't have, you don't have that personal encounter with Jesus Christ. There was a story told about a famous theologian who was asked to come and speak at a public address at a seminary, and, and he's got maybe multiple PhDs in theology and so he came and he spoke he spoke for two and a half hours teaching and explaining that this resurrection of Jesus Christ is an emotional mumbo jumbo it's based on this tradition that Christians so called believed in this Jesus who in fact did not even really existed so this so called theologian spoke two and a half hours uh, refuting and fighting 
that there is no such a thing as a resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And after two and a half hours of sort of lecture, he says, does anyone have a question? And the auditorium became silent, dead silent. Who dared to ask this PhD guy who's just spoke for two and a half hours? So there was a silence for maybe 30 seconds. And, and all of a sudden, way in the back, this old gentleman stood up. And he took out a, a bag like this. And in that bag, he took an, an apple like this out. He said, Professor, I, I have a question. And everybody looked at him and says, who is this guy asking this professor this question? And he says, my, my question is very simple. And he started eating the apple. Like this. Sir, I have a simple question. My question is, I never read the books that you were talking about. I never heard of these people you're talking about, Niger or Heidegger and all these authors that you quoted. I never heard of them and I don't know them. In fact, I cannot even read the Bible in Greek, in original language. But my question is a simple question, Professor. This apple that I'm eating, is it sweet or sour? And the professor kind of was um, kind of confused the fact that he was asking this question, but he did go ahead and answer. He says, Sir, I cannot answer that question for I have not tasted that apple. And that moment, that elderly person looked straight into the eyes of that professor and said, Neither have you tasted my Jesus. Neither have you tasted my Jesus. Have you tasted Jesus? Is Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? Have you encountered him personally? You want to be used by God? You got to have personal experience. Like Jacob, wrestling with God. Like Paul, on his way to Damascus. That type of personal encounter is what you need. Like Zacchaeus, on the way to Sycamore Tree, and he found Jesus. That's the type of personal encounter you have to have if you want to be used by God. Because you know what Jesus does is he changes us from inside out. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, old things have gone, the new has come. You want to be used by God? You need to encounter Jesus. If you're already a believer, that should be renewed daily through your quiet time and your devotion. If you're not a believer, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the beginning point. Without that, you cannot be used by God. Even though you want to, you can't. You know, you think that, well, I'm coming to church every Sunday. That should do something. Well, yeah, it will do something. You will fill in one seat. That's about it. I give a little bit of my offering to God. Well, you may give your tithe and your offering. That doesn't do you any good. That's not going to get you into heaven. I'm serving in certain ministry. Great, great. But you really need to encounter God before you can be used. By God. And that's what we find in Peter and John. They were no longer the same person, like we sort of recited at the very beginning. Let me tell you the third thing that we find about Peter and John. They feared God, but not man. They feared God, but not man. If you look at verse 17, verse 17, the NIV, as I was reading, it says, warned, but the New King James, the better translation says, threat. So verse 17 and verse 21, you will find the word, they were threatened by these religious rulers. And it's not an empty threat. It's not something you say, you know, I'll kill you kind of thing. It's an empty threat. You, you are not going to literally kill someone, but for them, they knew it was not an empty threat because they knew what happened to their master, Jesus Christ. 
Peter followed, John followed. They knew what happened to Jesus. They eventually crucified Jesus when there was nothing against him. They falsified the witness. Not only did they, they threatened him, but they crucified him. So Peter and John, they took their words seriously. Something heavy might have been waiting for them besides the imprisonment. So they did not take it lightly. So they threatened these people and said, if you continue to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, you, you, you will get it. And listen to what Peter and John says in verse 19. If you have your Bible, take a look at verse 19. This is what they said. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. Again, you see the courage in Peter and John. And that courage came because of their personal encounter with their Lord Jesus Christ. They chose what is right before God, not what was easy way out. Let me tell you what we should fear. In Matthew 10, 20, 28, Jesus said this, And do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But Jesus said this, you ought to fear him, referring to God, who can not only the soul, the, kill the body, but take away your soul, who would judge your body as well as soul. The question we must ask is that, is it going to be my way or his way? You know, John Knox, his life was described in this way. He feared God so much that he never feared any face of the man. He never feared anybody because he feared God so much. And H.G. Wells said this, The trouble with so many people is that the voice of neighbor is louder than the voice of God. Did you hear that? We worry about what people might say about me. How would they think of me more than what God would think of me? So we fear people. What if they don't like me? What if they judge me? What would they think of me this way? So for that, I would rather not do this or I would give in to and not obey the word of God. And that's fearing people than God. So whom do you fear? Man or God? What are you pursuing after? God's applause or man's applause? Peter and John was very clear. They did not fear man because they feared God. And may you do the same thing. And here's the last thing that I want to share with you this afternoon. And that is, that is that they were passionate about Jesus Christ. They were passionate. They were excited about Jesus Christ. You know, you know I've talked to a lot of people and, and over like 10 minutes of conversation with anybody, you could sort of tell what kind of thing that they were passionate about, excited about. People who like golf and they, they would talk about golf. People like I like soccer. Uh, I'm not good at it anymore, but I play soccer, and so whenever there's a chance I do play, and I bring that up. And people who are into sports, they talk about sports. People are into stocks and bonds and investing, they, they bring it up, and what's the market like? You know, they bring those subjects in because that's their sort of interest. With the current economy, I think people do talk about it quite a bit, but and that's what Bible says too in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. For out of mouth one, uh, out of mouth of flow, that his heart, the full of, will speak. So whatever that is in your heart, it will come out is what the, what the Bible is saying. And that's what we find in Peter and John. What did they have in their heart? Verse 20. Verse 20 says this. For we cannot keep our mouth shut about what we have seen and heard. Is they are saying, you know, I cannot keep my mouth shut. I cannot be quiet about things that I've seen and heard. What did they have seen and heard? About Jesus. They were so excited about Jesus. You know, about eight years ago, not eight, not quite yet, next year, another exciting event takes place, right? World Cup. See, I'm bringing up soccer again. The World Cup is coming up. And in that, during the World Cup, hopefully the Korea will advance to what used to be in uh, 1992. If you remember 1992, uh, never done before. We entered into semifinal, not even 16th, but then now into, I was up in, in the United States, waking up like 4 in the morning with the red t-shirt that says, Te Hamingo. You know, I did that. We were so excited about this and we watched together. 
I knew that this Korea, it was packed with people out in the street watching together, right? I'm sure you have done it the same thing. And I even heard that some restaurants are giving away jajangmyeon for free. I read in the newspapers. I don't know if it is true or not, but they were giving out free. In, back in the States, in LA, they were giving out sundubu for free. People were excited. They were passionate about this Korea advancing to semifinal. And I was excited too. But let me ask you this. Not just that, but many other things that cause us to be very excited. How excited are we about Jesus Christ? How excited are we about Jesus Christ? Who gave us eternal life? Who had no sin, but took the sin like the praise leader was leading? He didn't have to, but he did it while we were yet still sinners. How excited are we about this great Jesus, our Lord? And I know there are people who would line up in 10 hours to buy a, a baseball game, a soccer game, and buy a video game. And I know there are people who are excited into buying the first item or watching the first movie or great concert. Are we excited about Jesus like that? Willing to come to church five minutes early, 10 minutes early, so we could start praying that maybe the God's presence will be made known to everybody as we gather to worship? Do we do that with the excitement? Or do we come in just in the nick of time so I don't miss too much, but yeah, I don't want to be there too early? Is that the excitement we bring into the worship? It's a bunch of oxymoron words that we live by. You know what oxymoron is? It's a two words that's contradicting one another. Let me give you an example. I also play once in a while golf. And if you play golf, you have heard of this big, the first driver. It's called wood. But if you see it, it's not made out of wood. But they call it wood, right? That's the oxymoron. It's not wood, but they call it wood. Plastic glasses. It's a plastic, but yet we call it glasses. Working vacation. If it's working, it's not a vacation, but we call it working, and yet it's a vacation. Yeah. Exact estimate. If, if you heard of that term, how can you be exact and then it's estimate? It doesn't make sense, but those are oxymoron. Have you heard of jumbo shrimp? How can you be jumbo and shrimp? Shrimp is small. And how can you be jumbo and then small at the same time? It doesn't make sense, but we use this term. But let me give you oxymoron terms for Christians. Lukewarm Christian. Spectator Christians. Uncommitted Christians. These are oxymoron. You cannot be Christian and yet uncommitted. You cannot be Christian and be spectator because Christian means Christ following person. How can you follow Christ and yet you know, just stand distance and, and spectate? You can't do that. Jesus says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It's an oxymoron and we live by these things. And it is okay for us to come have Pastor Paul and come and speak and do all the work. For me to spectate and enjoy and be an observer. No. God never called us to be observer. If you want to be used by God, remember the four things that I talked about. Yeah, yeah. It's okay to be an average person, but be courageous. Have personal encounter with God daily. Be you know, bold about sharing gospel. And don't fear people all they can say is no. One of the things that I've learned, this is something that I, I have experienced recently. Is that in Korea, everything you have to haggle, right? If it's 10,000 won, can you give me for 9,000 won? In, back in the States, you don't do that. If it's 10,000, you pay 10,000. So I'm so accustomed to paying as it is. And so when my wife and the, our family goes to buy some things and it says 10,000 won and my wife says, uh, can you make it like 9,000 won? And I, I feel so embarrassed. I know it's a cultural thing here, so I start backing away. Because, oh, man, how can you ask for less? Just give as it is, because we don't do that in, in the, back in the States. And like Pastor Paul said the same thing, and my wife said the same thing. All they can say is no. What are you to be afraid of? Yeah. It's a reputation thing, isn't it? 
What would they think of me? Don't fear man, but fear God. The last thing is that be passionate. Be passionate about our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close with this uh, little story. It's about the little monk. There was a little monk who was given opportunity to speak at a, a chapel like this. And, and this monk was given a first opportunity to speak, and he didn't know what to say. So he paced back and forth, thinking, what am I going to say to fellow monks? And he was thinking and thinking, you know, I, I don't know what to say. And he stayed up all night. His eyes were like bloodshot because he couldn't get asleep. And he stood before, and everybody was looking at him, and he says, do you know what I'm going to say? Of course, everybody didn't know, so they shook their heads. says, neither do I. Bless the benediction, and we are dismissed. And so the, the monk senior came after him and says, no, 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 that's not right. I asked you to lead a devotion. You cannot do that. So you do it again tomorrow. You better do a good job, you know. And so he's thinking, you know, what am I going to say? I don't have anything to say to my fellow man. So he stayed up another night, and, and he's getting a bigger bag under his eyes, and his knees are shaking, and he goes, oh, what am I going to say? So he stood. The next morning he came around, and, and everybody came listening, and he says, do you, do you know what I'm going to say? And at the time, everybody wanted to help out. He says, yes. He says, good, then I don't have to tell you. Receive the benediction, you're dismissed. So the monk senior came and chased him and says, last time, one more, if you do it, you're going to be in severe punishment. You better do a good job tomorrow. And he's now back and forth again. He says, what am I going to say? I couldn't say it. I couldn't think of anything. And he's back and forth, back and forth thinking, what am I going to say? Three nights in a row, he couldn't stay. He couldn't sleep. And bigger bag under his eyes. And he's just palms shaking and sweaty. And so he came next morning. And by this time, everybody heard from the town that this monk has something to say, hopefully. So the whole town came and stood. There was no empty seats. And they were all listening, waiting to hear what he has to say. And little monk stood and looked at all these people and said, do you know what I'm going to say? At that time, half of this aisle says, yes. Half of this aisle says, no. So she's, he looked at them and said, those of you who knew, can you tell the ones who don't? And, you know, that is so simple story, yet there's a profound message. Those of you who know, about Jesus Christ, like Peter and John. Gold and silver I do not have, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You have something in you that you can share, that you can be bold about, you can be courageous about. If you do that, I believe God will use you mightily for His, his kingdom ministry. May God use all of you, all nations, fellowship church to bless and impact this Tejan area as well as globally. May you be used for God's kingdom. Let's pray.